So as you can see, uh, the screen's not working, and I'm gonna do something creative right now. Everyone turn around. Uh, we have a cheat screen back here at the back for us. I want everybody to make sure that we can engage together. Surprise if you didn't see the big 200 inch screen on the back wall. Um, as we continue to sing together, let's all engage together. I don't want anybody to be left out because they don't know a word, because they don't know what's going on. So if you wanna turn around and use that, if you know the song, you can keep facing this way. Uh, I just wanted to give it to you as an option. Maybe don't do that next week. We can certainly do that this morning.
Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I'm nothing else fit for a king, except for a heart singing. God, as we gather here in worship, we're just in, even in the situation that just happened. Or it's a reminder that while things in this world fail, when things in this world fall short, when what we've planned doesn't work out right, God, that we can know that you're in control or that you're sovereign you're good, you're working for your glory. God, I thank you what a privilege it is to gather in here today to celebrate the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. God, to witness three people, four people who have given their life to Jesus Christ and have come forward to share that publicly with their church family. God, to gather in rooms across this campus, across all ages, to open up your word, to study, to talk, to share, to reveal, to cry, to encourage, to celebrate. God, to gather in here together, different backgrounds, different weeks, all for the sake, Lord, of knowing more of who you are, and celebrating, Lord, who you are. God, I pray in all that we say, that all that we do in here will bring glory and honor to your name. God, I pray if there is anyone here who does not know you, whether it's through the words of a song, whether it's through a testimony of baptism, Lord, whether it's through a word of scripture, Lord, that through it all, that they could be drawn to you and that today will be the day of their salvation. Lord, all for your name, for your honor and your glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, welcome to Willow Ridge Church. What Berger just did, if you weren't already aware, is he let you in on our little cheat sheet that we have in the back of the room. The, uh, the worship team has the lyrics to their song so that they can see them so they always know what line needs to come next of what they need to do, but you watch them, they got their eyes closed, they're leading worship. And if you're not aware, I'll, I'll tell you what, since Burger, you had a vulnerable moment, I'll have a vulnerable moment. Y'all turn around and look at, back at the screen. It says message remaining and there's a countdown. <laughs> they pay attention to the lyrics. I don't always pay attention to the countdown, right? <laughs> that'll preach, that'll preach, all right. But we're glad that you guys are here. We're glad that you guys decided to get out of bed this morning when it could have been an easy day to stay at home and come here and to worship with us today. If you're a first time guest, you'll see there's one of these cards that's around you. Uh, if you wouldn't mind filling out one of these and then on your way out the door today, my wife and I will be at the back uh, hand left here or back left hand side of the room. If you would drop that off with us, we would love just to thank you for being here and, and worshiping with us. If you've got any questions about our church, that's a wonderful place to get those questions answered. But if you don't have time, if you've got somewhere that you need to be, we still would like to know that you're here. And as you walk out, these two sets of double doors right there, there's a little basket in the middle. And if you wouldn't mind dropping that off, we would greatly, greatly appreciate that so that we know. And if you've got questions on here, you can list those and we can look to connect you and to have you uh, be a part of and engage any questions that you may have. Today is, is a 
special day for us. Today we're going to have four people that are getting baptized. And then at the very end of the service, we're going to partake in the Lord's Supper today uh, together. And so really quickly, if you're here and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, we know there's a lot of guests, a lot of friends that are here for baptism. If you're here with us and you want to partake in the Lord's Supper as a follower of Jesus Christ, you are invited to, whether this is your church home or not, whether we're part of your denomination or not. This is for all of those who claim Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and trust in his work and in his work alone. So if you missed that, if you missed one of the little cups uh, that we had as you came in for communion, um, right now or, or at any point in time, would be a great time just to go back and grab one of those so that you can partake in that with us uh, together. Well, I do want to explain uh, what we're going to do here in just a moment as we have baptisms. So as I shared, we got four individuals that are coming forth today having already professed their faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. You see, the act of baptism is not the act that saves you. That's not it at all. To be saved, you trust in the person and the work of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross and the power of the resurrection and, and the fact that he is alive and you've surrendered your life to him as Lord and Savior. And every individual that is coming forth today to get baptized has already shared with one of us as a staff that they have surrendered their life to Jesus Christ, that he is Lord and Savior of their life. And they've had that conversation with us. And now today what they are doing is they're being obedient to the call of Christ to after salvation to go and to be baptized and so we are sharing that with you today that we as a church can celebrate the fact that these four individuals were once apart from Christ but are now united with him and they come forth telling a story through their act of baptism last Sunday was Easter Sunday it was a great Sunday Churches all across the world filled with individuals celebrating the fact that Jesus is alive. Well, the Bible tells us that when we come to faith in Christ, that we are crucified with Christ. And that we've experienced the power of the resurrection even in our earthly bodies today. And so what you're going to see this morning is a testimony. It's the same testimony for everyone who comes to faith in Jesus Christ. That these individuals, as they come forward, will represent their old selves of who they were before Christ. But that as they walk into the water, they're identifying in his resurrection, uh, and I'm sorry, in his crucifixion. They're putting their faith and their hope and their trust in the work that he did on the cross, where Christ paid the price for their sins, for your sins, for my sins. And he died. And they die in the, in the power and the spirit of God to their old self. And just as Christ was laid in the tomb, they will be laid back into the water. And just as Christ walked out of the tomb, was risen from the dead, they too will be raised from the water. The water symbolizing the newness in Christ of who they are. The old washed away, covered in the blood, made to be new, to walk in the newness of life of who they are now in Christ and in Christ alone. It's definitely not an act that saves, but it is an act that all are called to who've put their faith, their hope, and their trust in Jesus Christ. And so a lot of different churches baptize different ways. A lot of different churches celebrate in different ways. And here's how we've kind of created within our culture at, at Willow Ridge to, to celebrate. We, we celebrate a, a lot of things. We like to go to to, to sporting events, we go to graduations, and when, when the person at the sporting event, when the person at the graduation, e even the person at the retirement party, at, at the end, when, when the moment happens, when we've all been waiting for it, and, and success, and there's something there, we clap and we, and we cheer. And so we feel that that's what we're called to do. That we're not celebrating a person, but we're celebrating a savior. But what we are doing in the life of these individuals as we do that is we're affirming them and we're encouraging them in the greatest decision that they've ever made in their entire life to put their faith, their hope, their trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So would you join me as we welcome them and as we celebrate their Savior? So first we're going to have Elizabeth Hansen and she will be baptized by Don Coulter.
Elizabeth, you have a smile that will light up a room. When you walk in, the energy that you have, it is contagious and it is good. And now what is so exciting for all of us, your friends, your family, for everyone to see, is that light that is inside of you is the light of Jesus Christ. And he's called you to go and to shine that light wherever you go, in your home, in your school, with your friends. And we know that's the life that you're going to live for Christ. And so we baptize you, our sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Next, we have Christy Fink, and she will be baptized by David Allen. It's uh, been a joy to get to know uh, Christy, Keslin, and Colby, uh, the Fink family, over the last several years. Uh, what really thrills my heart about their story is that years ago, uh, one of her co-workers invited her to church, uh, Robin Fry, and uh, Christy decided along with her family to come to church, and for the last several years, they've been coming to church. And just a few months ago, uh, the entire family joined our church, and one of the steps in becoming a member of Willow Ridge Church is to be baptized. Uh, they come already professing their faith in Jesus Christ, uh, but today they come as, as joining the church in, in baptism as well. And so it's an honor for me to, to baptize, baptize Christy this morning uh, into our church family, uh, already being a part of family of God. So Christy, upon your profession of faith as a believer in Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Next, we'll have Kesslyn Fink, and she will also be baptized by Pastor Dave. Kesslyn's also one of those, when you, when you talk to her and see her, see you already see it, a little smile, a little grin on her face. It just She lights up the room, and so again, it's been a joy to to get to know her over these years. Kessel, upon your profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We've got Colby Fink, who will, be, who will be baptized by Pastor Joel Van Ham. <laughs> That's right. Yep. <laughs> so uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but Colby's worked here at the church for the last couple of years, and uh, getting to know him uh, has just been amazing. Uh, Colby is at the uh, USC in the program for uh, medical, yeah. desire to be a doctor. Uh, he also recently showed me a video where he's benching over 315 pounds. <laughs> so it's nice to know that you got a kid working for you that's smarter and stronger than you. <laughs> this is one up. Uh, Colby, uh, talking with you about your faith in Christ has just been amazing and what he's doing, not only in his life, but at, at BCM, at, at USC. And, just sharing the love of Christ with his family and, and everyone who he comes into contact with. Um, it is because of his profession of faith uh, that we get to baptize him today, our brother, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Would you guys join me as we pray for these four individuals? God, I thank you so much for what you're doing. 
God, thank you for what you're doing in our children's ministry, what you're doing in our student ministry, what you're doing all across our church. We're to see men and women and children whose lives are being changed by the power and the truth of the gospel. Seeing people commit their lives to follow you, to walk away from what this world has set for them to pursue you where they live, where they work, where they play. God, I pray for these individuals that have come forward today. I pray for their growth, their strength, their faith in you. Lord, I pray for us as a church that we would encourage them, disciple them, or speak truth into their lives, show them grace and mercy and love as well. All for your name and for your glory. Lord, what a wonderful privilege it is to be a part of the work that you're doing here. May you be glorified in all that we do. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'll turn to the screen, yep, I think we got some announcements for you guys. Kids are now dismissed to meet our volunteers at the back of the auditorium to be taken to their classrooms. If you're interested in becoming a member at Willow Ridge or just looking to learn more about who we are, you're invited to attend Discovering Willow on Sunday, April 21st at 10.15 a.m. This class is designed to teach you all about who we are, what we believe, and what it means to be a part of our church family. If you're interested in attending, email david.allen at willowridgechurch.org or visit willowridgechurch.org forward slash discover to sign up today. The Women's Ministry at Willow Ridge is hosting a prayer board craft night on April 26th at 6.30 p.m. There is no cost for this event, and supplies, appetizers, and dessert will be provided. To register, visit willowridgechurch.org forward slash craft. Please note that this event is intended for adult women only, and there will be no child care available. If you are considering being baptized or would like to know more about what baptism means, our next Discovering Baptism class is on Sunday, April 28th at 10.15 a.m. Baptism is a beautiful part of being a follower of Christ, and we would love to come alongside you in taking this next step in your journey as a believer. If you're interested, email david.allen at willowridgechurch.org or visit willowridgechurch.org forward slash discover to sign up. Join us on April 19th at 7 p.m. for Secret Church 24, The Book of Ruth. This event is a deep dive study of Ruth and how its contents can inform our prayer and our actions. For more information and to sign up, visit willowridgechurch.org forward slash secret church. We'd love to pray for you this week. Text the keyword WRC prayer to 833-352-0356 and our prayer team will be in touch. Well, good morning. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, I want to invite you to join me in John chapter 17. So Colby uh, sent Joel a video of him bench pressing 315 pounds. And I want to be honest with you. I, I was a little offended that Joel shared that. Because I sent Joel a video recently of me lifting 315. Close. I went to Sheely's recently and that plate was three pounds and 15 ounces of barbecue loaded up on that, right? That's impressive. That, that just hurt every part of my body to think about that, right? But good for him, right? There we go. Well, um, man, we've been we've we've taken a little bit of a break from from John and uh, I'm sorry from Genesis, and we've been looking at, at John in a little little different way of, of of in this Easter season. And I always like to not end Easter with like now we've kind of ended our Easter series, but I love carrying it over in, into the week after because there's so much that, that we can learn and that, that keeps us thinking about all of the events um, that, that surrounded that, that day. I mean, the week leading up and, and the days after. And this year, if you've been with us the last couple weeks, 
um, what we've done is we've looked at the, the, uh, the, the Easter story kind of through a little bit of a different narrative than, than looking just solely at the passage that, that deals with the crucifixion and the resurrection. And instead, what we've done is we, we've gone and we've looked at these conversations that, that Jesus has with, with groups or, or with individuals leading up to the crucifixion. And, and what we can do is we, we learn about the, the work of the cross and the power of the resurrection right, from the, the very words of Christ and the, and the days uh, and, and the, in some instances the hours leading up to this event right, that the Son of Man will, will, will go through and experience. And, and to me what is just remarkable about Christ in these, these moments leading up to this betrayal, the trials, the beatings, the carrying of the cross, the being nailed to the cross, is his heart, right? His heart for those whom he loves. His heart for the disciples. His heart even for Judas who would betray him. And so as I was looking in, in John very specifically about some of the, the, the passages that, that really revealed this, I, I wasn't planning on this passage of scripture, but as I was reading through, I came to John chapter 17. And I want to be honest with you, with what we're able to do this morning does not scratch the surface of all that we find in, in, in John chapter 17. But, but I want to give you a, a little bit of, of the setting and the impact of, of what we know as the high priestly prayer of, of, of Christ. Most biblical historians believe that this prayer is offered in the upper room. This is where the Last Supper was. This is where Jesus washed the disciples' feet. This is where Jesus tells them that I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And, and most believe that this was the last thing that Jesus did before he left the upper room to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. And what we see in John 17, I mean, the, the, gospel, the whole Bible, all right, the Bible is filled with explaining to us the person of who Christ is and the work that he's going to do. The Gospels even more so as we see his personal interactions. We see his care for his, his mother. We see his care for his friends. We see his care for those that he doesn't even know. But, but very specifically, I, I would argue that when you read John chapter 17 in this prayer, it reveals to us the most of this innermost being of who Christ is. It, it reveals his, his heart more so, it, it reveals his personality through this, his passion, his commitment in all that he is going to face, in all that he is going to do. So, so my challenge for you is, is I hope to be first faithful to what we have in this, in this time this morning, but, but also I hope that in the power of the Holy Spirit, it kind of whets your appetite a little bit. And, and if you're kind of looking for somewhere to land uh, for a season of time in your quiet time, I'll give you a little outline that you can read through this in some, in some ways here in, in just a little bit, but, but I want you to really focus in on, on this prayer of Jesus. There's so much that is there. As Jesus winds down what we think of traditionally as his earthly ministry, you know, as you think through of what, of, of Jesus' earthly ministry, you think of his miracles, you think of his teachings. You think of the relationships that Jesus has formed. I mean, think, of, think about his miracles. He's turned water into wine. He's fed thousands with a few pieces of bread and, 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 and fish. He's caused the blind to see. He's caused those who have been socially outcast because of their medical conditions that they struggle with to experience healing and, and bring them back into society. He's made the dead come alive. 
He's given big sermons like the Sermon on the Mount, but he's also narrowed it down and brought in and taught in small groups and taught the parables. We see the teachings. We see him form relationships. We see him form long-lasting relationships like the relationship he has with John, like the relationship that he has with Peter. We see continued on relationships within uh, his own family with his mother. We see him form instant relationships like we, we see with the woman at the well. We see him develop deep friendships like with Lazarus. We see the work of the crucifixion of the cross, of the pain and the suffering that he endured. We see the glory and the goodness and the power of the resurrection. And when we think of the, the earthly ministry of Jesus, it, at least in my mind, these are the things that I go to. If you're having a list out, like what did Jesus do when he was on the earth? This, th these events, these things that I just described would be what often fill, filled the pages. But, but oftentimes we forget the, the prayer ministry of Jesus. And that the prayer ministry of Jesus, that while it happened here on the earth, and we're going to look at that, but it also is continuing on today. We, we, we see Jesus teaches about prayer. He, he teaches us how to pray. That's where, the, that's where the Lord's prayer comes from. He says, when you pray, pray like this. But we also see that prayer isn't just something that Jesus taught about, that Jesus, that, that prayer was something that Jesus within his own life, it's something that he, he practiced. But in Jesus' prayer life, oftentimes we, we don't see like what we're going to see in John chapter 17. I, instead, what we see are, are verses like Luke 5, 16, where it says this, but he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. So Jesus, fully God, fully man, would withdraw from the groups that he was around for extended periods of time for rest and for prayer. But we also know that Jesus still has a, a present work of intercession that he does today. Paul talks about this in, in Romans 8, 34. He says, who is to condemn? Jesus Christ is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? Who indeed is interceding for us. And so right now, as we gather in here today, as we pray, as we sing, as we study his word, Jesus is interceding for us. The writer of Hebrews also talks about this in Hebrews 7.25. He says, consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So we see this, this, this work of Jesus, the prayer life and the ministry of Jesus was present and strong during his earthly ministry and present and strong still today is what he continues to do. And what John 17 gives us is it gives us an insight, you, you could argue, into to the most pressure-packed moments of his life. Knowing what awaits, knowing what he'll go through, knowing what he'll experience, knowing who will betray him, knowing who will deny him, knowing who will desert him, Jesus offers this prayer. So what I want to do is I want to read the, the entirety of, of Jesus' prayer, which is all of, of John chapter 17. And then we're going to look at three, three different things from this. It says, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you 
before the world existed. Verse 6. I've manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, you gave them to me. And they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I've sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. Verse 20. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be in us. So that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me. That they may become perfectly one. So that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I have made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love which, with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. In this one prayer, here's, here's the outline that I would encourage you if you want to use this this week, and it's going to be the outline that we work through this, this morning. In this one prayer, there are three different prayers that, that Jesus prays. The first that Jesus prays in verses one through five, Jesus prays for himself. Right, very interesting dialogue that Jesus the Son has with God the Father in this moment that's there. Then secondly, we see that Jesus prays for his disciples. Those are the ones that are currently with him, all right, in, in verses 6 through 19. And then Jesus prays for all believers in all time in verses 20 through 26. You and I make the list. Amen. All right. So in these prayers, here's what I want to do. I, w- I want us to look at as we journey through and, and we're going we're gonna to understand two questions. What does this prayer teach me about Jesus? What does this teach me about Jesus? When my grandmother passed away three years ago, uh, one of the things that I was entrusted with was her notes that she had stuck in her Bible throughout 
the time that, that, that she had had that particular Bible. And so I found sermon outlines that she had taken, notes that were there, Bible studies that she had been a part of. But one of the, the great things that I found in my grandmother's Bible was there was a handful of prayers that, that she had written out. These were her prayers that, that she had prayed. And I don't know if, if this was a one-time prayer that, that she had prayed and she jotted it down as she prayed, or I don't know if these prayers were consistent prayers that she liked to pray. So she'd go to her Bible, grab one of these prayers for her family, and then she would, she would read that prayer, say that prayer to the Lord. I, I'm not sure what she did with them, but I do know this, that when I read my grandmother's prayers, it was a woman who I knew deeply, but when I read her prayers, I knew her at a deeper level because it revealed her heart as she became before her Lord, who knew all. And, and I love this, that, that in this prayer, what we see and what we understand even more is, is the heart of Jesus. But then also this, is how does this prayer, hearing these, these words, impact how I live every single day as a believer and follower of Jesus Christ in light of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ? Right? What we've been talking about with Easter. How, how do we make... The crucifixion, how do we make the resurrection not a moment in history, not a historical truth, but an event that, that penetrates and permeates every part of our life as we go to live for his name and for his glory. So, so, so think about this. Think about where, where Jesus is in his earthly life, all right? The, the preaching is done, no more sermons, no more journeys to small towns. All is winding down, and what awaits him is death. All right, what awaits him is death. We're not gonna read all of chapter 17 again, okay? But I do wanna read Jesus' words about himself as this is what he fa focuses on, right? He knows it all. Peter will deny, Judas will betray. He knows the pain of the death that is there. He knows the loneliness that he'll feel. But here are his words. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven. Picture that taking place. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that the son may glorify you. Since you have given him all authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom have given him, you have given him. And this eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. For the fools of this world who would say not even Jesus himself claimed to be God, how can you look at these verses and not draw from this who he is? I love in this what we see is that Jesus' focus is on the glory of the Father and the glorification of the Son. In all that will happen, in all that will take place. Jesus knows that this has been the journey from the Garden of Eden and has been building to these moments. And what happens as he is lifting his eyes to the Father is the fulfillment of the prophecy. The Messiah has come. The Messiah has made a way. The Messiah has paid the price. The Messiah will live again. 
And as his blood will be spilled, what he sees in this moment is the glory of God in his glorification. Because every tribe, every tongue, every people, every man, every woman, and every child will have hope and salvation because of Christ and Christ alone. It will be through this act and this act alone that salvation is possible. Jesus says through this single work, okay, through his life, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. You cannot look at the life of Jesus and simply chalk it up as a moralistic example of how to live your life. When you look at the life of Christ, it will point you fully to his work and the necessity of the gospel for each and every woman and, and each and every man and each and every child, every single one of us. And that we identify in his crucifixion. Galatians 2.20, the apostle Paul writes, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The glorification of the Son. Jesus prays for himself. But Jesus also, the, the next and, and, and the majority of this, Jesus prays for his disciples. Jesus prays for his disciples. The prayer that, that Jesus offers specifically for this group of individuals whom he called, who have followed him, and during his, his ministry have been those that are the closest with him. And in this moment in history are still with him in this room. Not a large room hearing these very words. And, and here's what Jesus says among others that we want to focus on, that we want to look at, that he's done for them. He said, God, I've manifested my name to them. I've manifested your name to them. He said, I've shown them who God is, and they followed. They've seen God. They've seen Christ. He says, I've given them the words that you gave me. And, and it's not just that I've given them, that I've told them. This isn't an in one ear and out the other. It's they've received these. They believe these. Jesus says, I've given them the truth of your word. I've given them the gospel. And they know this. They've received it. And they believe your truth. And then here, though, is the tension that the disciples are, are facing, that Jesus is going to be leaving them. Remember, they're trying to walk through earthly situation with an earthly perspective while they believe, not fully understanding, or even have the developed faith that they will need in order to live in the power of the truth of the gospel. And so what Jesus offers them, he says, Lord, keep them. Keep them. Hold on to them. You've given them to me. They are yours. And then he says this, in your keeping them, here's what happens in this and all that they're going to face and all of the trials and all of the circumstances. And in those moments, most of whom will be executed for their work in ministry, Jesus says, though, they'll experience joy because you've kept them, because they're found in your hand because they're wrapped up in your arms, because their salvation is set. That's where their joy will be. You see, for them, following Jesus will not be just about the good times. Following Jesus for them is not gonna be them getting together once a year to recap all the cool stuff that happened when we walked around with Jesus. 
Following Jesus will not be, well, do you, guys, do you just remember when Jesus did that thing? Oh, that's great, and now let's just go back to our life. So no, following Jesus means that what awaits them is a life of struggle, is a life of being rejected, is a life of beatings, but Jesus says your joy is possible. And not only is your joy possible, your joy is certain because they're in your hand. You have kept them. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 8, 38 and 39, for I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor, nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is what they have and this is what they hold on to. All that they will face in all that they will do, God will be working in them and sanctifying them in the truth. God, while the world will be tearing them down, God is, using them to, God is using it to build them up and that God is keeping them from the evil one. Satan's not winning. God is. God is. And this, this is how weak cowards can in one moment hide in rooms and deny the name of Christ and will one day stand before councils and governments and proclaim the name of Jesus. Not because they're tough. Not because they've got all the words to say, but because they're kept and held in the hand of God. And it's him who's working in them because they've believed as they've received the word of God. Charles Spurgeon said, I read this quote this week and, and just love this quote. The more truth you believe, the more sanctified you'll, you will be. The operation of truth upon the mind is to separate a man from the world and to the service of God. And the more truth you believe, the more sanctified you'll be. The operation of truth upon the mind is to separate the man from the world and to the service of God. Right? And this service of God is to be sent into the world. To sent into the world. And so Jesus prays for the fulfillment of, of the Great Commission. As Jesus prays for all believers. Jesus prays for all believers. Jesus prays for us. I do not ask for these only, John 17, 20 says, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. I heard a pastor say one time long ago, before I was a believer, that in Jesus' journey to the cross, he had you on his mind. I thought, no way. No way. Not me. Not me. There's, there's no, if, if he is who you said he is, there's no way a person like me would be on his mind. John 17, 20. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. As Jesus journeyed to the cross, he prayed for all of us whose sins cost him his life. Wow. Oh, it's our fault. It's our fault. We're the reason. And in that, it's not the shaking the fist like it would be if it were me. Instead, I do not ask these things only, but for those who will believe in me through their word. Jesus, Jesus prays for the unity of the people and the unity of the mission. You and I, we, we have a hard time seeing past five minutes from now. We do. We have a hard time knowing what tomorrow is going to hold. We can have an idea, we can have a thought, we can have a preference. 
but Jesus knows and Jesus has set. And as Jesus is doing and as Jesus prays and as Jesus is acting out on every moment leading up to the cross and leading after the resurrection, there's a moment, there, there's a destination, there's a peace in the future, which we can hear about, but Jesus knows. And, and, and John, who, who writes this, will record this in Revelation 7, 9 through 10. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude, a multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and with palm branches in their hands, carrying out a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. What Jesus could see and what Jesus could know and what Jesus could call us to. And so the gospel will go from this moment from cowards who hide in rooms and will penetrate across the globe. And the gospel will be given to men and women today all over this world to take it to the dark places where people don't know. In homes, in neighborhoods, in offices, to other states, to other nations, to other tribes, to other people. What we will see in the work of the gospel coming from this moment after the resurrection, continuing on in Acts, what's written about in the, the epistles, what's fulfilled in Revelation 7, and what is still happening today is that the gospel will go out from this moment, cross ethnic lines from Jews to Gentiles. The gospel will cross uh, cultural lines from village to village. The gospel will cross language lines. What we see in Acts from these who were cowards but are now powered men of God living in the power of the Holy Spirit to see men and women come to know Christ is that the gospel will go from Jerusalem, it'll go to Europe, the Middle East, Africa, and India. Because in the power, in the unity of God. The gospel will cross socioeconomic lines from masters to slaves. And while we all remained different as defined by the world, we'll be unified in the message and the work of the gospel. And Jesus prays for his people to be marked by his glory. He says, the glory you have given me, I have given to them. Jesus prays that we will be marked by the evidence of him in our life and that they, upon seeing that, would believe in God. Matthew five sixteen. in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. The purpose of every moment of your life every moment of your life. And lastly, and we close with this. Jesus prays for his people to show his love. The love with which you have loved me, Jesus says, may be in them and I in them. Right? The great commandment given in Mark 12, 30 through 31 and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Basically, this is in all that you do and all that you are. Let it embodiment the love of God. And the second is this. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Aaron and I are teaching a uh, parenting class on, uh, at our 9 o'clock hour in our discipleship time. And we're talking about building and establishing a kingdom culture in your home. And today was how to set a kingdom mindset for your kids. And we started off, uh, uh, Dr. Tony Evans does a video, so we watch his video, then we have some discussion. And we, we started off by, by, by saying this, that the, the culture that you set for an expectation needs to match the culture that you set in your home. Meaning this, the, the gospel expectation that I set for Emma and that I set for Grayson needs to match 
the gospel expectation that Aaron and I set for ourselves as well. What we expect of them from our home needs to match what we expect of all of us in our home. Jesus is giving a commandment in Mark 12. And he says, this is what you were to do. But if what Jesus is, is saying in his life is this is what I've done. This is who I am. And if you're in me and my spirit lives in you, then this is who you're, you go to be. To live for my name and my glory. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you for this powerful prayer of Christ. Or to know all that awaits and all that he will face. Lord, and in honesty, he comes praying for himself. Praying that the glory of God will be shown. The work of God will be fulfilled. People will know. And he prays for the disciples. God, in their flesh. And Lord, I don't say this is a criticism because I, I, I would probably find myself right in the same situation. But God, cowards. Cowards. One minute they're arguing who's the greatest among them. The next is saying, I, I, well, I would never do that, Jesus. And then in the next, they run, they deny, they hide. But God, you, they, you chose them. You called them. They answered. You equipped them. They walked in faith. And Lord, you grew their faith. You empower them with your spirit and your work continued and your work continues. Lord, may these faithful men and women of past be faithful examples to us what it means to live in the grace and love God, you pray for us, every single one of us. God, I, I thank you. I thank you that you prayed for me. I thank you that you prayed for my wife, for my son, for my daughter. I thank you that you prayed for Elizabeth, for Christy, Kessler, and Colby. I thank you that you prayed for everyone who would come to know you. And that, God, we are held and we are kept in your hand. And we have life with purpose and mission to celebrate the fact that the tomb is empty, to live in the reality, Lord, that your spirit lives in us, that, God, that right now you are not just present in this space, but, God, you are present in the lives of every single one of us who know you, who have called upon the name of Christ, who is faithful to save us. And, God, in that calling and in that power, May we live for your name and for your glory. To sing praises to your name. To testify to those who do not know. To serve those who are broken and hurting. To love our neighbor as ourself. Or to love as you have loved. And God, as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper, may we be reminded of what it represents. It's not just a cracker and some juice. 
It represents more. It represents the body of Christ given on our behalf to take the death and the punishment that we deserved. It represents the blood that was spilled, but from that blood there comes life, there comes forgiveness, there comes newness, there comes hope, there comes joy. And God, we stand here as those unworthy but made worthy by the blood of the Lamb. May this not be a religious act that we just do, but may this be a declaration of our lives as sons and daughters of the living God in response to your sacrifice. And God, I pray if there is anyone here who does not know you, or that today would be the day of their salvation as they confess Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Worship team will lead us in a time of worship. Afterwards, I'll come back out on stage. We'll take the Lord's Supper together. We do have prayer encouragers on either side of our auditorium. If you came here today and you want to talk to someone about a relationship with Jesus, they would love to talk to you about that. If you came here today and you want to, you need someone, you're carrying a burden, you want someone to pray with you, they would love to do that. We just ask that you respond and how God's leading you. Would you stand as we worship him?
take your elements and remove the bread from top. Well, in that room that we just read about, Scripture tells us that Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you. Thank you for life and salvation in Christ. Lord, I pray that as we go from here, we would live in the boldness and the truth work of the cross and the power of the resurrection. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. One quick thing, one quick thing before um, before I leave you guys, something you're praying about. Um, this coming Sunday, um, I, with, a, with a small team of individuals um, from our church and, and one person from another church, we'll be making a journey to India. Um, we'll be there for about 11 days um, where we typically go into one area of of India and do ministry there and then return. Uh, we're going with a different agenda, um, a different plan in mind, and we're going to go into that city. We're going to we're going to be there and minister there for a couple of days, and then we're going to be traveling all over the country of India. We're going to end up in three additional states at different extremes. I was telling somebody, I was like, imagine like flying into New York, and then two days later you're going to go spend time in Miami, and then two days later you're going to go to Los Angeles, and then two days later, you're going to head to Denver, right? So that's going to kind of be our journey um, as God has opened some doors for some men and women who were serving in some very difficult areas uh, in, in ways that we could come alongside them um, and support them, pray for them, and partner with them in the work that they're doing. So um, we're going to see and experience a lot of great things. My, my, my prayer, if you would pray for us, is this, that we would not go and, and look at things through our own eyes or do the things that we would want to do that we would go and that we would look through the eyes of Jesus and that we would truly seek, God, what do you have for us? And when God gives us a yes, that we'd be obedient to that, and that when God gives us a no, that we'll be obedient to that. So I just want to encourage you to pray that for us. I've got two wonderful friends who are going to be filling the pulpit over the next couple weeks, Lee Butler and Steve Borlack, and so you are not going to want to miss. They are way better preachers than I am, all right? And so you're going to want to be here um, as they open up God's Word and are faithful to teach it. Um, and then I look forward to when we can get back and to give you an update and share all that God is doing in that wonderful, wonderful place, all right? So you guys have a wonderful day. Thank you so much for being here with us today.